If you have a cell phone, please uh, turn it so the ringer doesn't ring during the service or anything like that. Um, last Sunday we had a couple of children up here um, in the front and they were watching Tic Tac videos with the sound on during the service. And, uh, and going back and looking at the video, I can see that I was just looking over with my eyes pleading to the father, who I know was a great guy. He's probably just happy that they were quiet. But. <coughs> and I'd ask you also, as long as we're talking about stuff, um, when you're in the back during the church service, not the concerts, concerts are concerts, that's entertainment. But when the church service is going on and you're in the back by the, the office or the back by the coffee area, uh, just talk in a way that, that doesn't actually bleed through the whole room over here. You know, sometimes people get carried away and they get laughing and having fun and there's nothing wrong with that. But you, you get somebody pouring their heart out up here, not necessarily me, but you get somebody pouring their heart out up here and, and maybe it's a message that somebody really needed to hear. And all they heard was the punchline to a dirty joke coming from the back of the church. <laughs> and this doesn't happen in normal churches, but at the overflowing cup, anything can happen, and it usually does. Um, so uh, my wife has a my wife has a uh, thing that she says I don't know where she got it from, but it's uh, some kind of help is what helping's all about, and some kind of help is the kind you can do without something <laughs> like true. that. So uh, just be respectful of your neighbors. Um, now, one thing I would ask you to do, if you, if you are on your cell phones, is uh, tune into the Overflowing Cups Facebook page, put the concert on, and then just turn the volume off. And that way it shows more people watching. It improves the algorithm. It gets us out to, to more places. Apparently that's how that works. So uh, Jesus loves you. It is uh, Resurrection Sunday. And most of you have probably attended a church service already this morning where you've heard a uh, brilliant message. Uh, so we don't have to worry about doing that. That's already been oh. done. That's good. Um, Felicia, I would like to say, God bless you. Thank you for being here. And is there anything that you would like to just share with everyone that may or may not have happened this morning? I got baptized this morning. Yeah. 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 Got baptized this morning. That is wonderful. Praise God. Praise God. Just um, hang on. I'm doing my own stunts tonight. Um, <laughs> takes a second for it to turn on. Would you be willing to? You know, I mean, you can do it from there. You can come up and join it. Just why? What? Why today? What made your decision? I put you on the spot. I didn't tell you I was going to do this. But. <laughs> <laughs> I do this kind of stuff to my wife. I've time, always so wanted yeah. to, I mean, get baptized. I mean, I did when I was young and I didn't remember it. Mm -hmm. And God's been working really hard in my life in the last year between helping me heal with my, my anxiety, my divorce, my abandonment, my molestations. He's, he's been working through me a lot this year. Mm -hmm. And something told me when I was standing there, let your fear go. Go up there and do it. Yeah. Stop good. letting other people, that was my problem, mm -hmm. stop you. Yeah. You're ready. You are ready. good. And uh, I, I do not, as a rule, I don't say thus saith the Lord very often about anything. But the Lord says that it's not your anxiety right. and not yes. your all these other things. Right. We don't claim it's it. now His. And they're gone. They're washed yeah. into blood. They've been cleansed away. They're just gone. They don't belong to you anymore, so don't take them. I used to have a pastor that would say, don't take offense because it doesn't belong to you. <laughs> so congratulations. God bless you. That's wonderful. Can we give her a round of applause? Amen. Yeah. We made a good choice. Come on, Thank you. I, you, you're the guy with the microphone. 
There's been a lot of good stuff that's happened this week. Oh, I thought you were. Uh, I thought you had something to say. Me? Yeah. Town shy. <laughs> He, he felt how I feel, so he hurried up and grabbed the microphone. Oh. <laughs> thanks, thanks for helping me. I was, uh, Thank you. I was baptized in the Footville Church of Christ on Easter Sunday, um, 1993. And uh, my father had said that he wanted to be baptized. He grew up around church. His father had been a, a lay minister, a Pentecostal lay minister. And uh, his father had gotten saved right after Azusa Street uh, in 1907. There was a, a massive revival in Los Angeles uh, in a, an area of, of Azusa Street. And from there, people that were on fire for God went out across America. And as this was happening in America, it had already started in 1904 in Wales. Uh, in the United Kingdom and had gone out from there and God was doing a new thing and just spreading it out beautifully making people just on fire for God and my grandfather was a uh, a poor farm kid in Peshigo, Wisconsin born in 1890 and he and his brother went to a tent meeting from these people who had come from Azusa Street and he got radically saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, and he followed God his whole life. And uh, that man was a legacy, and he had words of knowledge. And he had this is a guy who gave my brother a scrapbook. He loved my brother. My brother was nine years older than me, and my brother was named after him. My grandfather was Robert Levi Archambo. My father was Robert Leo Archambo. My brother was Robert Lee Archambo. Uh, he did not have any children before he, he, well, he didn't have any sons before he passed. And I had always said that if I ever had a son someday, I would name him Robert L. Archambault, and he could pick whatever L name he wanted. But uh, that, that didn't happen. Unless, unless Maquette is going to pull a, a Sarah on me and we're going to start popping on kids. Yeah, yeah, never know. I my name from Mark to Abraham. Um, but uh, my, my, so my father grew up in this environment, and to him, uh, to him being around that environment was uh, because he he hadn't he hadn't caught on to it. He hadn't made it his own. You know, God doesn't have grandkids. God has kids. You know, Jesus doesn't have nieces and nephews. Jesus has brothers and sisters. And so for my dad. All he saw was that he couldn't go out and play on Sundays because they were endlessly kneeling in the living room at, at the farmhouse that he lived in. And he had all of this, this uh, just ideas about following Christ as being an inconvenience in his mind. Now, he was a good man, and he taught us it wasn't until after I came to the Lord in my, in my late 20s, early 30s and started getting serious about it that I realized that my parents had been giving us a godly heritage and teaching us the principles of the Bible without using the name of God or Jesus. We were still getting the same lessons because they had those lessons left over from when they were kids. But I can't be one of God's grandchildren because it doesn't work like that. So I came to the Lord in 1988, and in 1992, I actually gave my life to the Lord. You've heard me say this before. It's not the same thing. You know, it's one thing to mentally and in your heart acknowledge Jesus as Lord. It's another to actually surrender your life. Right. And in 1993, the next spring, I got baptized, and my dad had told me, one of his friends was the pastor of the Footville Church of Christ, and he kept telling my dad, you need to come in and get baptized. And I heard that in one of their conversations. They used to have coffee together. And I said, I'll get baptized. Heck yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, I'm ready. And he said, he said, yeah, great, okay, let's do this. Well, at the last minute, my dad backed out. And he told me the night before, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I'm not ready. And I said, 
but dad, you know, we kind of agreed on this. He said, no, and I knew not to push my dad about things. And something was missing. Um, he was going to get baptized because he had always been told he needed to be. But it wasn't anything going on in his heart. And a couple years later, 1999 to be exact, in the beginning of the, in the winter of beginning of the year, my dad was a voracious reader, and he had next to his bed, he would always have a stack of books he was going to read, and then a stack of books he had read that my mom would then put away. And every night he would stay up for hours. He was one of the most educated people I've ever known, uh, although he was not, he, he graduated from a trade school um, in his 20s, but he was a high school dropout. And back then in the 50s, you could do that. He dropped out of school as soon as he could, worked on the farm, joined the military, and they just let him in. And uh, when he got out of the military, they took that as good enough to be a high school equivalency. And they sent him off to trade school. So, but he was always um, very touchy about his lack of formal education. Again, he was a voracious reader, very intelligent on a whole myriad of subjects. So I had this book by Billy Graham, and I think the title, I, I don't remember exactly, but I think the title was How to Get Saved or How to Be Born Again or something like that. And I took that book and I slid it into, um, I slid it into a stack of books that I knew he was going to be working his way through. And on the very last page, it had the sinner's prayer. And then it said, put your name here, put the date here. And at the top of the page, I wrote, when you get to this page, call me. And I just slipped it into the stack. And about two weeks later, at about 10 o'clock at night, my dad called me. My dad never called me. I grew up in a household where the parents didn't chase you. You were, respect you were expected to just do what you were supposed to do and show up and, and you know, be a part of the family, even as an adult. So I called my mom every week, always, all the way up until, uh, all the way up until she came to live with us five years before she passed on. Um, and then I just talked to her all the time. But, so my dad never called me. My dad never came to any of my houses. He, it, it wasn't, the kids didn't. The, the kids didn't have the parents doting after them. The kids were expected to go in and, and pay their proper respects. And my dad called me about 10 o'clock at night, one night, in the middle of the week. And I thought, when I, when I saw the number, because it, was, it wasn't a cell phone, but it had the, you know, remember the old caller ID on the phones? And when I saw that it was his number, I thought, what's, what's going on? It's got to be something bad for my dad to be calling me. <laughs> and... Uh, he said, so, I read that book. Guess you think you're smart. Yeah, I prayed that prayer. All right, well, I'll see you tomorrow. Click. It's the only conversation we ever had about God. And I remember it very vividly. That was in the spring of 1999, and in May, my dad said, I guess I should get baptized. Now this is years after I had gotten baptized when we were supposed to do it. And he said, I guess I should get baptized. I said, okay. I don't want to go to the church and do it there. I don't, I don't, I don't want to do that. In front of all those people I hardly know, or I know too well. And uh, he said, how about if we do it in the pool? We can do it in the pool in the summer. They had a pool. I said, all right, well, by that logic, why don't we do it in the hot tub? Because it's a little easier to manage, and you're probably not going to drown. So, uh, and and it, was a, it was, I think it was Easter, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was Easter, because the whole family was there. And you don't get our family together. Funerals get our family together, and that's about it. And uh, it's a very small family, so you could have spontaneous family reunions at the gas station in Footville, too. That doesn't happen <laughs> once in a while. But 
He said, yeah, you want to get baptized. Well, my sister said, well, I want to get baptized. I've, I've never been baptized. And her son, my nephew, said, well, I want to get baptized. You know, if there's going to be a party, I want in on it. And so we talked about what that might mean. And my dad was just sort of puffing on his pipe and not paying any attention to the rest of us. In his mind, it was already settled. It was going to happen. So you guys have your little conversations, whatever. I've got important pipe smoking stuff to do. And, uh, oh, man, he was, he was a character. I'll tell you what. He, he would chew the stems off of his pipe that he always smoked VIP. To this day, when I was in the Air Force, I was away from home, and one of my buddies smoked a pipe. And he would keep all these different tobaccos and tins on the edge of his drafting table because we were we were graphic artists. We had drafting tables, and I would go over. I would buy my brands, my dad's brand of pipe tobacco, and and put a canister of it right on his desk so that I could go over and just smell it once in a while, just just to remind myself of home. My dad would always take his pipe and he always lit it with a with a match, and he would light the pipe. And he would get it going, you know, just hanging on to this thing. And it was hilarious because my dad was left-handed and his brother was right-handed. And they were just, they were 10 months apart and they were practically the identical person. And that, if she's watching this at any point, Jeannie, I'm talking about your dad. My, uh, my cousin Jean, who comes here every once in a while, um, her dad, George. And they would sit in a booth at these little diners, these little crappy diners that I always hated as a kid and now I love. And they would sit across from each other in these booths and my dad would like his pipe with his, well, I guess he would do it left-handed, but he'd do it left-handed. My Uncle George would do it right-handed and it looked like a mirror between them. I mean, they looked so much alike and they would do on their pipes and it, did, it was ridiculous. And then he would, and then he would, he would take the match and he would put it in his pocket after he had, after he'd blown it out. And he would put his pipe in there, and the embers from the pipe would still be going a little bit. And he always wore dress shirts, kind of, kind of like I'm wearing, only a little more, uh, my dad like. And he would always put his pipe in his front pocket, and every one of his front pockets had these little burn holes right in the very front and the bottom of the pocket, and. And then the day came, and they said, well, when, when do you want to get baptized? And so to get everybody together, to get all three of them together, we decided that the, the day we celebrated, my, my nephew's birthday is June 12th, and my birthday is June 13th. So we always had our parties together. I was 17 when he was born, and I never had a birthday to myself again, not that I'm bitter. And we decided, okay, on June 13th, June, to, June 13th, 1999, we got together and we had a baptism in the, in the hot tub. And then we grilled steaks on the grill. And that was it. That was the only conversation I ever had with my dad about God. That was, for him, it was just a personal thing. And he died on July 12th, 1999. And I'm so glad I had those moments. Because then he was gone. We, yeah. didn't, we didn't know he was going to die. He had a heart attack. He was fine up until a few days before he died. And then he just didn't feel right. He didn't feel right. I remember I was working on a job in Sparta. I owned a small construction company. and I was working on a job in Sparta. And my brother-in-law called me up from Footville about 5 o'clock in the morning. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting the guys up and getting ready to go to work. Why? And he said, yeah, you need to come home. Your dad's in the hospital. And I said, uh, no, he's not. And he said, well, no, you need to, you need to come home. You need to, you need to shut the job down and bring the guys, bring the guys home. And I said, my dad's not in the hospital. Nothing would shut down the job. He would never allow it. If he was sick, you would call me and I would come there. But we wouldn't shut the job down. And he said, just come home. So I knew, you know, it's a couple hour drive back from Sparta. And I knew, I knew he was gone. He had had a heart attack in the morning and uh, was gone. He didn't suffer. He was about three months away from retiring. He had sold his business. 
mom and dad had a house being built in Arizona and and big old motor home and they were all ready to just go and enjoy life. And why am I belaboring this? Because your time is short and my time is short. And it's not even how short time is for you, it's how short time is for the people that you love. Amen. Stephen Curtis Chapman has this song, While It Is Still Called Today. While it is still called today, won't somebody make it right? And it's all about just keeping your keeping your cords to your relationship short. Keeping those don't don't let people get reeled out too far and then have to try to reel them back in or miss it. This is not the message I intended to give, but I'm just rolling with it. Thank you. Uh, a couple of years ago, oh, yeah, before I get too far away from it, my mother, uh, who passed on a couple of years ago, my mother was uh, a very stoic Midwesterner type. Uh, her parents were both born in Belgium, and she was raised on a farm just outside of Whitewater, and, and uh, they were just... Stoic Midwesterners. She used to hate it when I'd say that, but I didn't care. I said it anyway. <laughs> so all kinds of outrageous stuff in front of my mom, but I wouldn't say it to her because I was respectful. But you know, I uh, I, I one time said something about uh, I said something about my my relationship with my dad was so you know it was really good. And my mom was in the room. I was preaching a sermon, and I said, "Yeah, my dad. My relationship with my dad was so good, and, and we were we were really tight, and I just adored him." And, and it was really great all the way up until my mom killed him. And I just kept talking. And my mom went, oh. <laughs> and I could tell she was half laughing and half mad. And I knew I was going to hear about it afterwards. My mom didn't kill my dad, by the way. Um, I said that joke at her funeral. All my cousins laughed. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, well, sorry. My, my dad's, my mom cleaned out my dad's closet about three weeks after he died. She cleaned up the house. You know, some people build a shrine to their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And the rooms that they inhabited are never touched again. Um, I have a relative who, when her grandfather died, her grandmother practically sealed off the house. And she would go in once a week and she would dust everything and keep everything exactly the way. And when she died 30 years later, the house was identical to the way it had been when he died. Wow. My mom took my dad's things that were personal to him that she wanted to keep. She put them in the top dresser drawer of his dresser. And otherwise she cleaned up the house and she took all of his clothing and his belongings that were his that would serve no purpose and she boxed them up and she sent them off to the Salvation <coughs> Army. Because my father lived in her heart, not in his possessions. Amen. Amen. And she was good about that. One thing you can say about my mom, she was not a hoarder. Mm -mm. She just believed in order, very much so. And But I, I say all that to say that she called me up one day and said, hey, come on over. I said, okay. She said, I need your help with something. I said, yeah, okay, cool. So I drive over to Footville. I lived in Broadhead at the time. And I drive over to Footville, and my dad had this big walk-in closet. And she said, I want you to go through, and I want you to take every shirt that you want. I know, because he was like four inches shorter than I am, and, and uh, you know, there's no way a pants or anything like that would fit. But, she, but his shirts will fit you, so pick out any shirt you want. And I said, Mom, there's no point. <coughs> and I, I can't wear any of these shirts. She said, no, they'll all fit you. I said, Mom, look at it. And I pulled out one shirt after another after another, and there was a little hole burned in this one, a little hole burned in that one, a little hole burned in this one. They, every one of them had something. And I just picked them up and I went, because oh, it smelled like Dad. It didn't matter how many times she washed them, it still smelled like Dad. And, uh, and then we moved on with life. You ever lose someone and you walk into the room to tell them something, only to suddenly realize they're not there. I can't tell you how many times in the last two years I've gotten to a certain point and I'd like grab my phone to call my mom because I wanted to tell her something. 
I talk to my mom all the time. And then she probably still hears me. And she probably still thinks <laughs> most of my jokes aren't funny. <laughs> she told me one time, she said, you really frustrate me sometimes. And I said, why, Mom? With a big smile. And uh, she said, because you talk like you could change the world. Amen. And I said, I can. Amen. Amen. And then she, that, that, that was it. There was no, she had nowhere to go with that. She didn't even, she didn't even argue. <laughs> you know why? Because I can. Yep. I can. Yep. So can you. Yep. Larry could change the world. Amen. Heck yes. Yeah, we could change the world. The world would be a better place, a more Larry-like world, a more Kevin-like world, a more Felicia-like world, if you just change it and modify it and make it your own. And the good thing is, you're a child of a king. Jesus did everything necessary to hand you back dominion of the world, your world. Make it your world. Amen. Make it your world, because by your very nature as being a son and an heir, by your very nature, with that Christ inside you, you will make it more Christ-like by making it more Ben-like, by making it more Margie-like. You can't help it. You can't help yourself. God would let you anyway. We have a Father that loves creativity. We have a Father that adores every creative thing we do. We have a Father who walked with Adam in the cool of the day. He could have named every animal and every plant and every everything all by himself. He didn't need Adam to do that. But he chose to include Adam in it. He said, Come here, boy. You think that one's called? Well, that, that giraffe. All right. Silly name, but okay. What? What? What's that one? What are we gonna call that one? Gecko. Gecko. That's got a cool sound. Gecko. It sounds like an action thing. Gila monster. But we're not gonna pronounce the G. I don't know what those names are in Hebrew or whatever language they spoke in the garden, but he was playing on the rug in the living room with his boy. Isn't that cool? Yep. Isn't that cool? Very cool. And God does new things too. Yes. And he wants us to enjoy them. Yes. And love them. And be thrilled with them and marvel with them. That walking in the cool of the day, that hanging out on the living room rug. My dad and I used to make model airplanes together. And my older brother, he made model cars with him. And it wasn't just about sniffing glue, although that has been a major impact on my life. <laughs> they changed the formula, don't try it. It's not, not like it used to. You didn't eat the paste, did you? Oh, no. No, but I, sometimes I drink the Kool-Aid. Right. That's different. <laughs> What's your favorite flavor? <laughs> the one that tastes like bitter almonds, strangely enough. <laughs> Never mind. Right. Way too far. <laughs> when you were being baptized, your father was going, check this out. Yep. This is so cool. This is the coolest. Oh, I love this. Yeah. yeah. Special day. It's a special day. There's something about the cleansing water of God. It's the only part of my message that I'm going to get to. And I'm closing my introduction. Isaiah 43, God is talking to the prophet Isaiah, to the people of Israel. 
He says, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. Jesus said, anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks behind him isn't fit for the kingdom. What he meant was, a plow has to be pushed. And if you're looking behind you, all of your work is going to be all messed up. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Keep your eye on the prize. Jesus did. Jesus did everything that he went through during the Holy Week. Culminating with hanging on a cross, suspended with earth no longer wanting him and heaven not yet receiving him and experiencing everything, including the pain of aloneness, which is a killer for any of us. Jesus did it all. And he said, he came to teach us about the kingdom. That was his message. Sometimes we get so caught up on the person of Jesus that we forget that he actually came to give us a message. He came to tell us something, to teach us something. So God said in Isaiah, Behold, I do a new thing. Now it springs up. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I will give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. That water that he brought into the wasteland, that's for you to play in and to rejoice in. Proclaim his praise to the heavens. It's interesting that he mentions animals. They proclaim his praise because he provided the water in the wilderness, but he says very clearly that he actually gave it for his children. He gave it for you. And there's water imagery everywhere in the Bible. Everywhere. The spirit. The cleansing. The power. I don't know why this is a baptism message. I don't know why it's not a resurrection mes message. Except that in that act of obedience, you tell the world that you who identified with the world, you who are born into Adam, are sharing the death, burial, and resurrection of God. That you're taking part of that. That you're being a part of that. That you're claiming that as your own. And then you are free. Then you are cleansed free. He who the Lord makes free is free indeed. Yeah, I had a whole message. <laughs> drop the mic later. Yeah, yeah. I'll do it. I'll do a mic drop later. It's in these things that we find God. We've all had our experiences that are tremendous. Seeing a child for the first time. Getting married. Getting baptized. All of these things are symbolic of things having to do with the kingdom of heaven. God is about family. God is about relationship. And then you take that <coughs> and you allow God to raise you up as his own. And then he gives you responsibility and he gives you a task. But Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. Love one another. 
love one another. It's not always easy. Not by a long shot. Sometimes people are mean to us. Sometimes we're mean to people. Sometimes your mind is so focused on whatever's going on that you just can't see the hurt that somebody else next to you is going through. Um, I'm going to give you a little advice from 1988, August, Great Falls, Montana. I was in the Air Force and my friend, Ron Montgomery, who worked in the same shop that I did as a, as a graphic artist. We were in the security room because you could go and you could flip the switch saying that you were working on top secret documents and no one could come in. So that's where we went if we needed to talk in private. This is your government money going in action. <laughs> think about that. Also think about the fact that we were children and we had the control of nuclear weapons. <laughs> Because I was in Strategic Air Command, which is that's nuclear a, weapons. That's a yeah, that was a frightening thought. I was 23, 24, something wow. like that. And I was one of the older guys in my shop. Now I look at them like, you're babies, you're babies, what are you doing? Go home. Play video games. Um, Ron Montgomery said to me, out of a clear blue sky, we were just talking about something, and I had said the sinner's prayer the day before. I didn't know what it was, didn't know what it meant, had no clue, really. All I knew is that for the first time in my life, I knew that there was a God, and I knew that it somehow had something to do with Jesus. I wasn't exactly sure what, but it made me cry every time I thought about it. It just pierced me. My soul, my heart knew, but my brain didn't yet have a clue yep. and that's okay sometimes that's where you start you start by saying something and you don't know why you believe it but you believe it and then God just grows from there okay we can deal with this got you now <laughs> Ron, Ron looked at me and he said people are going to hurt you in church other believers will sometimes cause you pain. You will sometimes hurt people. And you will sometimes cause them pain. But your relationship is with God. Amen. Try to maintain good relationships with the people around you, but understand that you will blow it. And do not lose hope when you blow it. And do not lose hope when people blow it and you're the victim of it. Because God's an overcomer. And now you, because you are a part of that, you're an overcomer. Don't let it pull you under and take you down. Several years ago, 20 years ago, I had some church situations come up that I got a little beat up in church. And I wasn't real thrilled about stepping back into that environment. And so I was I was already moving to Arizona. So it wasn't like anybody was going to notice that I wasn't in church that next Sunday. And I just sort of I just I never gave up on God. But I did the whole very mature and handsome adult version of going <coughs> And God kept saying, I love you. I love you. Come play with me on the living room carpet. If that's what it takes, if you, if you can't stand right now, then let's just go back to that. And I never gave up on God, and God never gave up on me. And eventually, he got me back around. I've said this many, many times. I'm going to say it again right now. If you have a call of God on your life, which we all do, by the way, 
You can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> it doesn't matter where you go. You can be locked up in a cell. You can be living under a bridge. You can be hanging out in a corporate office, flying in a jet. It does not matter. If you are trying, if God's saying go to Nineveh and you're taking a fast boat to Tarshish, he'll send a whale to swallow your butt and puke it up on the shore. And you're probably not going to look good when it's done, but you're going to do it. Not because he hates you. Not because he's forcing you. He's not a monster. But he knows the plans he has for you. Plans for your good. I was telling my beautiful wife on the way to church this morning that this last year doesn't make any sense to me. We went into it with such great promise. And we've made a couple of trips in to different parts of the country to try to help family members who are addicted to drugs. And to my earthly mind, we got nothing done. To my earthly mind. Got in an automobile accident. I had a stroke. Yesterday afternoon, thank you all for your prayers, by the way. Yesterday afternoon, I thought I was having a heart attack, so I went to the doctor. Now, I've had that same feeling many times in the past, but because of the stroke, it's made me a little more sensitive to not wanting to necessarily die right at the moment. Because if God had to resurrect me to get me to do the stuff that I'm still supposed to do, I have every faith, that, every confidence that that would happen. Um, and I was talking about the year and how it just seemed like there was no fruit from this last year and then it's just been it's like spits and sputters and nothing quite coming together guess what every one of those things fits into this beautiful tapestry right. of what God is weaving this incredibly beautiful piece of art and it includes all of you. And it includes every experience that I've had and every experience that you've had. Because all things work together for good, for those who love God, for those who are called according to His purpose. So maybe things aren't working together for good if you're running in the wrong direction. But man, just turn your eyes to Daddy. Because when that tapestry is done, it's going on to the biggest refrigerator in the history of the universe. And it's going to be this beautiful refrigerator art. And God is going to say, my kids did that. I love it. It's beautiful. He's doing new things in your life right now. He's doing it. Felicia, thank you. You are an inspiration to all of us. Um, Dave, could I ask you to come and close in prayer? I think they're all done. All right. I think it was Lance Walnow. Anybody know Lance? Yeah. Not personally. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel like I know him personally. <laughs> He's a goofball, man. But he is one man that is used of God in such a mighty prophetic way that um, a lot of the things he has said, I watch I watch his blogs, or not blogs, but <coughs> podcasts. Yeah, yeah, podcasts regularly. Oh, I think it was probably like seven months ago, he said that um, if you're truly in love and in line with God, and you know you have the call of God in your life, and you're pursuing that, that calling, even with clarity, um, but you're not getting, it seems like you're not gaining any traction. And he says, he said something to the effect that you have to think of the life of Joseph 
God revealed and disclosed to him a portion of his of his divine calling prior to him being sold into slavery by his brothers, right? And uh, and then he was uh, I, the whole story. It just contradicted everything that he knew God called him to do. Okay, for several several years, right? And uh, to spare the whole story. He said, if you're in that situation where you are pursuing God with your whole heart and things in the natural do not look like they're, like, like, like they should be, right? <laughs> that he, he, he identified that as a contradictory, I don't want to use the word circumstance, but I can't think of another word, but contradictory circumstances. Okay. So you have to analyze your own life. You have to really search your own heart to see if that's where you're at. But that explained, explained a lot to me about my life. Now, I've been a believer for over 50 years, and I cannot, there are so many things I can't figure out. Because you think if you do A, you should reap B, and B should reap C. Uh-uh. Especially not on the mission field, right? Not overseas. Um, but so I want you to really, you know, David said he was a man of the God's own heart. He said, God, test my mind and test my heart. Ooh. So there's a lot to be learned. Thank you for that message, that resurrection message tonight, brother. It truly was. And uh, because we're going to stand and we're going to praise God. We are going to stand right now, and we are going to praise God. Everybody, even towards the back, we are going to stand and praise God. We're going to exalt His name, because His name is above all names. Amen? His way is the way. Amen? He went to the cross and sacrificed Himself of His own volition, His own free will. No man could take His life from Him. He gave it for you. For you and you and this guy here, and the guy's flanking me. Uh, wow.